Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I don't believe this will be a lengthy message, but I do believe this will be an extremely positive and encouraging message for everyone in this room and for those of you that love the New Covenant online. Every day we are bombarded with the most heartbreaking, disappointing, sometimes discouraging news possible. Hardly a day goes by that we are not inundated with the negativity of everything that is happening around us. And all of it needs to be addressed. And we need to understand that we are in a war, that we are in a battle. This is not a game. This is not a recreation room. We are on a battlefield. And how we conduct ourselves as soldiers will determine the outcome of this battle. But once in a while, it's good to be able to bring a positive message that our souls desperately need to hear. And today, I believe, is one of those messages. So I hope that folks in the room will be enthusiastically clapping once in a while and I hope that those of you online in your groups and your satellite groups or maybe by yourself at home will be clapping yourself because we need this. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 18. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am. What are people saying about me? And they said, the disciples, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He, Jesus, saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? You see, it doesn't matter what the whole world says. Jesus wants to know what you say, what you believe, what you think. Doesn't matter how popular it is. Doesn't matter how other people will disagree. What do you say? And Simon Peter, old Mr. Foot and Mouth himself, <laughs> who's often said so many stupid things with a right spirit usually, but impetuous as he was, sanguine as he was, he just blurted out what came to his mind. And one time it cost him a severe rebuke from Jesus, didn't it? Get thee behind me, Satan. But not here. He got it right on this one. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, who I am, Christ, the Son of the living God, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. There's some Greek play on words here. The uh, Roman Catholics take this passage to say 
that this is where Peter became the first pope. And the Catholic Church started with Christ, with Simon Peter being the first pope, and they used this passage as their proof text. Very, very incorrect and a devilish doctrine. Thou art Peter. The Greek word for Peter's name is a piece of a rock, a stone. That's what Peter means. A piece of a rock, like a rock has been chipped off and stone falls down. Uh, and that's, that's the word describing Peter's name. Thou art Peter, a little stone, a little piece of a rock. Upon this rock, not Peter, the rock here, the Greek word, means a mass of rock, a boulder. Christ is speaking of himself. He is the rock. He's saying, he's contrasting. He's not saying Peter's the Pope. He's saying, Peter, you're a little stone. Upon this rock, and I'm no doubt in my mind when Jesus spoke these words, he somehow pointed to himself. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The church is built on Jesus Christ, not Simon Peter. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But what I want you to see in our text is the narrative of Christ's identity among the Jewish people. What was the narrative about Jesus among the Jewish people? The narrative was that he was Elijah or Jeremiah or another Old Testament prophet come to life. That was the narrative going around of the people about Jesus. Among the Pharisees, the narrative of Christ's identity was that he was a deceiver and a liar. So that Jesus opens the conference, what are people saying about me? Who do they say that I am? What's the narrative that you are hearing about me. Well, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're one of the prophets. Come back from the dead. Whom say ye that I am? The narrative of the Pharisees. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Wherein... I suffer trouble or tribulation as an evil doer, even unto bonds, even unto imprisonment. I suffer trouble as an evil doer. As a criminal, the narrative among the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people regarding the Apostle Paul was that he was an evil doer or a criminal. That's what everybody said about him. He's a criminal. Oh, that, that Paul. Yeah, I know about him. He's an evil man. He's a criminal. So much so that they put him in prison, which means they had charges against him according to the law. There was a prosecution that took place. There was a judgment by a court that took place. 
and he was thrown in jail as a troublemaker, as a criminal. That was the narrative about the Apostle Paul. That was the narrative about the Lord Jesus Christ among, Jude among the Jews. Now you know this, but let me articulate it nonetheless. Whoever controls the narrative controls reality in the minds of the masses. Let me say that again. Whoever controls the narrative controls reality in the minds of the masses. And that's what the mainstream media and the Washington establishment attempt to do on a daily basis. Control the narrative. Because if they can control the narrative, they will control what people think in the country. Most people do not have the independent mindedness to think outside the popular narrative. It's like whenever you're in high school or junior high school or even elementary school and all the kids in school or in your class are all going in one direction or they all think one thing. They all have an idea about whatever it is. Well, what do kids do? They want to be popular. They want to be liked. They don't want anybody calling them names. They don't want to be unaccepted. And so they go along with the narrative of the rest of the class or the rest of the school. That mentality carries over into adulthood. When they get in college, same thing. When they get into the workforce, same thing. The attitude is, I want to get along with whatever everybody around me thinks and says. So the majority are controlling the narrative for everyone. And that's what the mainstream media is doing. And I, I hear all these people, especially on the conservative side, talk about how they don't believe the media, that's baloney. Conservatives believe the media just as much as people on the other side of the aisle. When it comes to Ukraine, they believe the media. When it comes to the Middle East, they believe the media. When it comes to anything with foreign affairs, they believe the media. What is it? They're controlling the narrative. And by controlling the narrative, they control the minds of the masses. As a result of the narratives surrounding Jesus and the Apostle Paul, the result was Jesus was crucified and the Apostle Paul was beheaded. The narrative against these two men caused their martyrdom. Well, Jesus wasn't a martyr, excuse me. He died as a savior. Paul died as a martyr. But of course, history, both secular and sacred, have proven that both of those narratives were wrong, which changed the spiritual narrative for the next 1,800 years. History proved the narrative about Jesus among the Jews was wrong. The narrative about the Apostle Paul among the Jews was wrong. And the change of narrative, of the narrative, changed history for the next 1,000 800 years. For the first 1900 years, 
back up. For the first 19 centuries of church history, the narrative regarding national Israel was that it had been abolished by God in the ashes of Jerusalem's destruction in 70 AD and in the rise of Christ's new covenant. That was the spiritual narrative of the church for 1,800 years. I want that to sink in. For the vast majority of church history, the narrative was Israel was abolished in 70 AD and the rise of the new covenant. That narrative was true. And it guided the church for the first 19 centuries. The result of that true narrative were things like an explosion of New Covenant Christianity during the first two centuries AD. An explosion of the New Covenant Christianity during the great Protestant Reformation in Europe during the 16th through the 19th centuries. An explosion of New Covenant Christianity during the Great Awakenings in North America during the 17th through the 19th centuries. All of those and, and other regionalized revivals and reformations that took place throughout early part of church history were a part of the true narrative during those first 19th centuries regarding Israel. Are you still with me? Okay. Have I laid a good foundation for you? But since the early 20th century, okay, so for 19 centuries, the true narrative of Israel prevailed among the church and great revivals and reformations and awakenings and spiritual explosions took place throughout those 1900 years, including the creation, the conception of the United States of America, the greatest free land to ever exist on the face of the earth. It was all a result of the right narrative about Israel in the church. But since the early 20th century until the present, the narrative regarding national Israel is that the Zionist state born in 1948 is a revived, resurrected national Israel. And the thanks for that goes to mainly C.I. Schofield and his Schofield Reference Bible, which was published at the early part of the 20th century. The narrative was hijacked by Satan. And the narrative began to permeate the masses. Whereas the narrative of truth had permeated the masses of the church, for 19 centuries, now the hijacking of the truth changed the narrative and now the church is believing a lie. The narrative had changed. In the same way 
that the Jews falsely believed that Jesus was a resurrected Old Testament prophet. So too, most of the 20th and 21st century evangelicals falsely believe that Zionist Israel is a resurrected Old Testament Israel. Don't you find that interesting? Jews in Jesus' day, the narrative was, he's a resurrected Old Testament prophet. The narrative of the evangelical churches today is Israel is a resurrected Old Testament Israel. Interesting to me, the similarity. The devil hijacked the truth and substituted a false narrative to deceive men. The false narrative about Jesus 2,000 years ago kept people from accepting him as their Savior and Messiah. The false narrative poisoned their minds about who Jesus was and therefore those folks who believed their narrative could not and would not accept him for who he really was. And so too today, the false narrative about Zionist Israel keeps many people from accepting Christ's new covenant. They can't understand the new covenant. They don't want to understand the new covenant. They have no desire for the new covenant because their minds are filled with a false narrative about Israel. Think of it. For 19 centuries, the narrative about national Israel was true. But for the last century, one century, out of 19 centuries, one lousy century, the narrative about national Israel is totally false. Ladies and gentlemen, understand, dispensational futurism is not historic Christianity. It is something brand new out of the pits of hell to try and undo and reverse 19 centuries of true New Covenant teaching. But the people today believe, oh, this is historic Christianity. Been around for a hundred years. Well, gee, I know people that have lived that long. <laughs> Boy, that's really a long time, isn't it? One lifespan. No, this is an aberration of church history. This is not reality. This is a devilish trick to change the narrative and thus permeate the minds of the masses with false doctrine. For 100 years now, Zionists have controlled the narrative about Israel for a hundred years, a little more. The Zionists, Christian and secular, have controlled the narrative about Israel. For years and decades, you couldn't say anything bad about Israel without being ostracized by everybody. And it's still that way in many churches. And it's still that way on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. But it used to be everybody because they controlled the narrative. In business, in colleges, they controlled the narrative. But my dear friends, 
listen to me when I say, all of that is changing. And I'm not making it up. I got a phone call this week from a dear friend of mine and ours. He's a Washington, D.C. attorney. They watch regularly. He and his wife are wonderful Christian people. Bill, as a, an attorney who is licensed to practice law before the federal courts, is one of the great champions for freedom that we have in the legal profession today. He is constantly writing briefs to the circuit courts and the Supreme Court relative to cases that affect our liberty. And he's very effective at what he does. He's a tremendous scholar when it comes to the law and the Constitution. They're dear friends of Liberty Fellowship and they're personal friends of mine. So Bill calls me up this past week. He says, Chuck, I want to tell you about this large Christian radio broadcast that is located here on the East Coast. And this, it's, a, it's a Christian program, if I didn't say that. I think I did. And the host of this broadcast this past week played a segment of one of my messages on Israel. But they refused to tell the radio audience my name. <laughs> I love it. And the, and the part they played and I've said this two or three times in, in various messages, so I don't know exactly which one it was. But basically, it's where I say, tell me again how God is blessing America for blessing Israel. And then I go into a few uh, lists, and I say things like, how do our education systems today compare to 1948? Better or worse? How do our political institutions today compare to 1948? Better or worse? What about our families? What about our society? What about our crime rate? What about our culture? What about our churches? Our financial and economic situations? Are they better or worse than 1948? After all of America's blessings upon Israel, where is the evidence that God is reciprocating his blessings upon America? And, and, and that's the part that they quoted. And not, not quoted, they actually played my voice. But they didn't give me credit, of course. After playing that segment, there were two hosts, I guess, because one host, he said, said to the other host, what do you think about that? And the other host said, he's ignorant. <laughs> he's ignorant. You see, they cannot deal with the issue. They cannot answer my questions. Please answer the question. Where is the evidence that America is more blessed today than we were in 1948 after 75 years of, quote, blessing Israel? Answer the question. They can't answer the question, so they call me a name. And that's all they know to do. When you don't have any facts, when you don't have any answers, then you call somebody a dirty name. He's ignorant. Oh, wow, that's profound. <laughs> you know, you could have thought of something a little bit more original than that. Now, here's what I want you to take away from this. Number one, 
I receive calls or emails, mostly emails, from people like Bill almost once a week. Once a week would be an exaggeration, but at least two or three times a month, I receive a call or email just like Bill's. Chuck, I heard a radio broadcaster. I heard a podcaster. I heard a pastor damning Chuck Baldwin and Liberty Fellowship for our position on full Israel. This is happening every week somewhere around the country. There's a broadcaster, a podcaster, a pastor. Somebody is damning Liberty Fellowship and damning Chuck Baldwin because of our position on full Israel. And the only response that they can give is to call me, us, a bad name. He's ignorant. He's stupid. He's an idiot. But the fact that they feel that they must respond to what we are teaching reveals that they are afraid that we are effectively changing people's hearts and minds with the truth. And you know what? We are. And they're scared to death that people are going to listen and think about what they hear. I guarantee you that when people in that radio audience, that Bill was telling me about it, apparently it's a very popular program and station, when they heard that clip of my message, anonymous as it was, many of them said in their hearts, that makes sense. I need to learn more. I guarantee you, if there were, say, tens of thousands of people that were listening to that broadcast, there were hundreds who were saying in their heart, that makes sense. I need to learn more. That's why they didn't reveal to them the author of who said that, because they didn't want people going under the computer, finding me, listening to some of the other messages, and pretty soon they're going to be a faithful follower of Liberty Fellowship because they are hungry for the truth, just like you were a few years ago. That's why the host cowardly refused to tell the audience my name. They didn't want people looking us up, and reading and watching what we have to say. Number two, the next thing I want you to take away from this, I did an interview with Rick Wiles, Rick Wiles week before last. In my interview with Rick, he told me, and, and this was a new one to me, I, and Rick has a pretty large ministry and a large television uh, outreach and, and video. He's been in Christian television for a long time. He comes out of the, now I'm, I may not be exactly accurate on this, but if it's not the PTL or, or CBN or some of those kind of large international television uh, programs, that's, that's his background. I may not be specifically right on which ones, but he's, he's got a lot of experience and he's been in the industry for a long time and he's, he, he knows how to research, and he's got staff to do all this and, and things of that nature. So during the course of our interview, and if you haven't watched it, it's, we got it on our, our webpage at chuckbaldwinlive.com is where I, we, I post all of my interviews, and Rick's interview is up there. It's at the top of the list right now. So I urge you to go watch it. It was a good interview, about an hour long. But he said something that was absolutely fascinating. 
And it just served as further evidence for the message that I was preparing to give you today. He said that his organization has researched all of the, well, I say all, all, either all or most of the major Christian television ministries in the, in the United States. They've researched the statistics of these, I can name them, you know them, all the big name televangelists, pastors who have big television ministries. They did the research at True News on these television outreaches. And he told me on air, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'm pretty close. You can go listen to exactly what he said if you watch the interview. He said, he either said all of them or most of them have lost significant numbers of viewers. Whereas a year ago, six months ago, their viewership was humongous. He said now they've studied the numbers, and he said they're all reduced significantly. In fact, he said the truth of the matter is that you'll never hear. The truth of the matter is there's only a handful of people that are even watching them anymore. Rick would not say that on air if he hadn't done the research to back it up. At the same time that these major televangelists are losing the vast majority of their viewerships, internet broadcasts such as Liberty Fellowship and True News are growing exponentially. Yeah. Why? People by the work of the Holy Spirit, I believe, are being awakened and illuminated in their hearts to the truth, and they're tired of the old, false, antiquated, untruthful, Zionist-controlled narrative about Israel, and they're looking for the truth. Here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. Christian Zionists are losing control of the Israel narrative. They're losing control of the narrative. And what Israel is doing in Gaza is only affirming that the Christian Zionist narrative on Israel is as phony as a $3 bill and what we are teaching about Christ's new covenant and the abolishment of the old covenant is absolutely 100% true. What's happening in the Middle East is confirming the lies of Christian Zionism and the truth of the new covenant gospel. If you are newer to this broadcast, I urge you to start by watching the Israel packages. We have three sets. This is the foundation for the prophecy packages, giving you the truth about 
biblical Israel. The prophecy packages, we have three of those so far as well. Last Sunday, I preached number 19. We have two messages since we finished the third package. Next Sunday, on March 3rd, I'm going to preach message number 20 from Revelation chapter 16. So we're still continuing through the series. I would also very much encourage you, you want to learn the truth, I'm trying to help you. We have two products on the same subject. First, the book, The Destruction of Jerusalem, was written in 1805 by George Peter Holford, who goes into immense detail documenting, chronicling what happened with the destruction of Jerusalem. It, it will blow your mind. This was the single most horrific military battle in the history of the world. To this day, there has never been yet another battle, and I don't think there will be, that compared to the destruction of Jerusalem and the overall death and carnage that took place as God destroyed the, the, the old covenant and brought in Christ's new covenant. Israel had to be abolished. The temple had to be abolished. And it had to be done in such a way so as to convince the early church that the Old Testament was gone. And now the new covenant was born. And it took something of this magnitude to convince the early church of the abolishment of that old covenant, which they were all still holding on to, and the acceptance of the new covenant, which was brand new to them. So Holford's book, 1805. I preached a message in 2019 by the same title, The Destruction of Jerusalem. Without a doubt, this is the single most requested message of any message I have ever preached. More people have ordered this than any other message. Maybe all the rest of them put together. I'm not sure about that. In this message, I quote quite a bit from Holford's book. But there's other material that I include that Holford did not include. So when you read the book, you're, you're going to miss some of the, the history that I put in. If you watch the video, you're going to miss some of the history that Holford puts in. You put the two together, and you're going to have as complete a picture as you can of the destruction of Jerusalem and what it meant regarding the abolishment of the Old Covenant and the rise of the New Covenant. That's the theme of both of these materials. One is in book form, George Halford, 1805. This one is my DVD message on the same subject. I encourage you to say, well, which one should I get? I encourage you to get both. Again, because both, both are adding material that the other left out. So I strongly urge you to get those books as well as the prophecy packages that I just told you about look like this, the three that we have so far and the two messages that have followed. And then message number three will be next Sunday on Revelation 16 and Armageddon. Now, as God put it in the heart of Egypt's Pharaoh to harden his heart against the truth, which led to his own destruction, so too God has put it in the heart of the Antichrist, Israeli prime minister, to harden his heart 
against the truth, which is already in the process of leading to his own destruction. Benjamin Netanyahu is committing self-destruction. Anybody who hardens their heart against the truth to the degree that Pharaoh of old and Netanyahu of today have done, they are bringing God's destruction upon themselves. I have three messages on the Israeli genocidal war against Palestine. It's called End Time Israel. Three messages on one DVD. I hope you will watch it. I'm wrapping up. The younger generations of both Christians and non-Christians are seeing through the phony Zionist narrative and are rejecting it outright. All the polls, secular and sacred, say the same thing. The younger generations are repudiating the Zionist narrative about Israel across the board. In another decade or two, the Zionist narrative of Israel will be rejected by most Christians and by most of the American citizenry. Count on it. It is coming. It is inevitable. The false narrative of Israel that has been controlled by the Zionists for over a hundred years is coming to an end. And when that day comes, it will be the day that God will begin to restore America's liberty principles. And the church will begin to proclaim the new covenant gospel. When that day comes, it will free up the new covenant gospel and the preaching and proclaiming of it. It will free up America's founding liberty principles. And I predict a revival spiritually and governmentally for the United States once the narrative on Israel has been thoroughly and positively changed forever. But for today, folks, for today, rejoice. Christian Zionists are losing control of the Israel narrative. Thank God. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.